September 1986 to June 1986. And your head state called the first assignment. He proceeded to the U.S. government in 1990 and obtained his own VSO of the Philippines in March 1994. He had his internship at the University of the Philippines. Between December 1994, in the Visiting physiotherapy lecturer at the University of Ghana Accra and master of my degree in Azexina Examiner in the Physiotherapy Undergraduate and Postgraduate Program of the Bathroom and the World War University League and University of Lagos. In the course of his career, he served among others as sub-dean undergraduate in nursing and physiotherapy from August 2002 to July 2004, clinical coordinator in undergraduate and postgraduate studies in physiotherapy. Member College of Medicine Fundraising Committee 2002 to 2006, Chairman College of Medicine Ceremonial Committee 2004 to 2006, Editor Faculty of Clinical Sciences Newsletter 2008 to 2010, Representative of Congregation from the Senate of the University of Iran 2009 to 2012, for being postgraduate 2010 to 2012. Member Senate Committee on Drafting Evaluation Tool for Teaching by Lecturers of the University, Member 63 and University Committee of the University, Member Quality Assurance Policy Drafting Committee. He has been Chairman of the Teachers Association of Tana International School, 2011 to and Patron of the Medical Student Association, among others. He is currently the Managing Editor. African Journal of Physiotherapy and Rehabilitation Sciences, an editor in chief in the Journal of Nigerian Society of Physiotherapy. Professor Kolako Amazat is married to BC Hilda Amazat Nilani Yon. He is married to Blessed with three children. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tim Lama, the call of Professor Amazat to deliver a lecture titled From What to What? The Neurophysiotherapy as a Returning Officer. Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Administration, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic, Registrar and other principal officers, Provost of the College of Medicine, Dean Faculty of Clinical Sciences, Dean Postgraduate School, these are other faculties and of students, members of the university community, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. This lecture would have been delivered on 11 July 2013. It was, however, shifted to today due to the industrial action in back performed by Nigeria, the Academic Staff Union at the University, for the future safeguard of Nigeria's education system. Although the sacrifice, although the sacrifice I had to make was painful, 
it was necessary, and thankfully it is yielding positive results. It is therefore with great delight and honor that I stand only before you all to present today's inaugural lecture on behalf of Faculty of Clinical Sciences. Mine is the second inaugural lecture from the 47 year old physiotherapy program of this university, coming after the first one presented on 25 March 2010 by my teacher and mentor, Professor Aniona Olafson Bosson, entitled Physiotherapy and Bond of the Lab. When I received a memo dated 28 December 2020 from the Faculty of Clinical Sciences, informing me of my nomination by its executive committee, to present this lecture, I immediately took up the challenge. I saw no need to wait the expiration of the 21 day window to indicate my status and submit a topic. Hence, my written response got to the dean within three days of receiving the memo. I thanked the dean, Professor Yajayeva, and the entire faculty of clinical sciences for enabling me, even this kind of gesture, to become the fifth physiotherapist to deliver an inaugural lecture in the entire West African subregion. Earlier ones were delivered by Professor Emeritus BCB Uwuga at Elaine, Professor I. Uwuga University of Lagos, our own Professor Ariola Olasun Bosnia, University of Ghana, and Professor M.O.B. Olao Uwuga. Mr. Vice Chancellor, I would like to give you indulgence to start by acknowledging my parents, the Haji Hamzat of the Salam Alaga and Haji Atoke Hamza, for equipping me with sound moral and spiritual as well as academic education that formed the foundation for me to attain the professorial status in the Nigerian Premier University. I am proud of and very grateful to them. I'm truly happy to be the Nero Physiotherapist. Certainly knew about medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and others, but hardly anything about physiotherapy. Yet, they approved of me studying physiotherapy, a divinely chosen profession as my mother was showing me. Today, 23 years after I matriculated as an undergraduate student of physiotherapy in this university, it is debated if physiotherapy is better than student now than then. My take on this is that physiotherapy profession still faces the challenges of being misunderstood, misconstrued, under-recognized, and undervalued, particularly in Nigeria. This stems from a lack of understanding of its meaning, scope, and placement within the head setting, sometimes even by fellow healthcare service providers. Then it's physiotherapy. The straightforward description of physiotherapy or physical therapy is that it is a branch of medical science that is the treatment of injuries and all disorders by using physical methods. Some accounts show that the practice of some form of physiotherapy started about the time of physician, people practice and lecture sometime around 460 BC, who use master directed therapy to reduce stress, relieve pain, and stimulate healing in their patients. Available records suggest that Swedish gymnast Stanley Walliter became physiotherapy professional in 1813, and that the first structured physiotherapy in Great Britain was due to activities of some nurses who were engaged in the art of massage in 1894. Physiotherapy came to Nigeria in 1946 with the then royal, now National Academy for School of Support and Friends. Since those early days, my profession has grown from a mere blend of different massage procedures in 1894. Through a practice of combining master and Swedish remedial exercises via the heart of using physical modalities to treat disease conditions to becoming an independent clinical practice that stands on scientific foundation. It has actually evolved from the status of an eminence based practice to that of a profession that thrives on evidence based procedures and protocols. It has become a dynamic profession with a studies theoretical and scientific base as well as widespread clinical application in the restoration maintenance and promotion of optimal physical function. Physiotherapy represents both an art of healthcare and a profession. Grammatically, it is both a noun and a verb. Composite words, it is both an art and a science. The skills component represents the art, while the rationale behind each of these skills captures the scientific component. Physiotherapy, or physical therapy, as it is called in North America, is concerned with identifying and maximizing quality of life and movement potential within the space of promotion, prevention, treatment, habilitation, and rehabilitation. This encompasses physical, psychological, emotional, and social well being of the people. The scope of physical therapy practice is not limited to their patient care, rather, it includes advocating for patient care, teaching, research, public health strategies, 
developing and implementing a policy both nationally and internationally. One of the probable factors still limiting understanding and appreciation of physiotherapy in Nigeria is the non availability of the standard definition in indigenous Nigerian language. According to Ora history, his own description as commonly in Yoruba was occasioned by a central role in helping to restore working function among children who are lower in paralytic poliomyelitis. I like to describe the physiotherapy in Yoruba language as a more accurate measure is your body. Come on, if I want to see a bad day, go to our wives and see their love on the mirror. We are talking about the same thing. I'm going to be very happy. Specialties of physiotherapy include pediatrics, geriatrics, cardio respiratory, musculoskeletal, industry, women's, community, and neurological physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is my profession. My source specialty is nearly physiotherapy. A career choice that was actually based on natural affinity. And the interest stimulation I was constantly getting by observing that Nigerian physiotherapist upon Nipo Stanley, the legendary late Fadil will be required in the meditation of the Mr. Vice Chancellor, for over 19 years, I have practiced physiotherapy on many worlds and in many ways. To give account of these travels, I present to you my inaugural lecture entitled From World to World, the Neurophysiotherapist as a Returning Officer. <laughs> to clear the air, this lecture is not about the politics of and concerning Nigeria. I am neither a politician, although there are many of them in my family. No, I'm not a political scientist, even though I admire many of them. I'm only a truly happy Nigerian, an indigenous of Ukiaremo, Yemetu, in War 3 of the Badalon local government area. In War 5 of the Mibori Naki local government area. You can do this from this far, traveled from home to take up lecturing and appointment in this far away place, University of Ibadan, which incidentally is also situated in War 12. Of the same part, not local government area. Neurophysiotherapy. Physiotherapy is a vital component of the entity. But neurophysiotherapy is a new class of medical rehabilitation. The team typically includes neuromental neurosurgery, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, psychotherapy, audiological rehab, sexual therapy, relaxation, and music therapy practitioners. Neurological disorders constitute important cause of disability affecting all age groups and exert a significant impact on social economy and psychology of those of people. Whenever a neurological problem arises, rehabilitation provides a solution. The neurophysiotherapy is still the center step. As a neurophysiotherapist, the variety of patients and clinical conditions I manage covers the entire human life. It ranges from a pregnant woman to the newborn, through the middle age room, and all the way to the geriatric patient. This implies that the neurophysiotherapist can play a role at any locus in the spectrum of human life. Anyone may need the services of this expert, especially with the advancing age. Rehabilitation of the person with neurological deficit by way of description is a process of ensuring that he or she lives a meaningful, qualitative, and prolonged life by restoring function as much as possible. It involves multidisciplinary and multidimensional therapies, which entails process of assessment, planning and goal setting, therapeutic intervention and evaluation of all. The neurophysiotherapy is essentially a movement expert who manages movement as function which can manifest as too much, too little, and no movement at all in the neuromuscular activity of human biomechanics. The primary purpose of neurophysiotherapy is optimizing mutual performance new task oriented exercise and training. It is therefore all about improving motor function, which is the main precondition to enhance physical function, restore independence, and prevent development of secondary. What are the reasons for which a patient is required to be Mr. Vice Chancellor, the specific clinical presentations are treating the radiological patient with paralysis, pain, abnormal muscle to contract loss of sitting and standing balance, skin coordination, and normal gait pattern, associated disorders like the cubitals of sound, which can result from the non human However, by far, the most important role I play as a neurophysiotherapist is in restoration of mutual ability, and this is a prerequisite to functional reform. The general principles underlying my interventions are as follows. One, 
identifying and establishing persons of mutual impairment. Two, analyzing the mutual disorders with a view to breaking it into mutual task components. And three, provision of appropriate physical intervention aimed at correcting the identified mutuality. The intervention is executed through teaching by instruction, demonstration and training the patient in how to perform the component of the mutual task assessment. This is followed by repeated performance, that is, regular practice by the patient to ensure proficiency in the task. The patient is then re-evaluated to ascertain how much he has learned and how well he is able to perform the mutual task with or without assistance or support. Minimal physiotherapy intervention is therefore analogous to teaching or learning in the classroom setting. Please note that, like any teaching learning situation, some construct will influence the success of the intervention among the learners. This construct can be classified as a patient, environmental, and manual factor. Let us look at these factors one by one the patient factors. By the patient factors, we mean the type and severity of the disease, the age, sex, quality of intervention, affordability, and accessibility to the physiotherapy care. Patient self motivation and psychological makeup, spiritual and social support, most especially sponsored support, as well as impact of caring on the health and quality of life of the patient and the family caregiver. The impact of neurological events usually affects by both the victim and their family members. Therefore, we manage the patient holistically by including the informal caregivers in my physiotherapy intervention. Generally, Physiotherapy intervention in neurology is such that apart from the treatment administered in the clinic, the neurophysiotherapist prescribes some programs to the patient. Home programs are exercise procedures and functional tests that the patients are expected to practice at their respective homes under the supervision or with the assistance of the informal caregivers. The informal caregivers are the spouses, the parents, children, and other relations as well as friends. This necessitates inclusion of the informal caregivers of the patient in the assessment both setting and management. It is also relevant to the total care plan that the impact of the disease on the patient's life, including their quality of life and that of their caregivers, are well understood. These postulations called me to collaborate with others to carry out research work in that direction. I present to you some of our findings in regards to stroke and cerebral palsy, which is regarded as the most common in the pediatric condition seen in the physiotherapy clinic. Cerebral palsy is primarily a motor disorder. Physiotherapy plays a little role in this habilitation. For these children, accurate assessment is essential in order to design appropriate physiotherapy intervention. Unless there is an agreement between the patient, the caregivers, and the healthcare providers on what functional disorder the patient has, goal setting and attainment will become a mere illusion. Our observation at the physiotherapy clinic is that there is often a disparity between what the caregivers typically report as what their children with cerebral palsy could do at all and the motor function assessed by the physiotherapist in the clinic. We therefore investigated the level of concordance between the physiotherapist and the family members in assessment of motor function in children with cerebral palsy. The two groups study similar values and we concluded therefore that either one of the care providers or the caregivers may objectively assess motor function in cerebral palsy. In the 2007 study, we investigated the impact of caring on the generalized status of caregivers of children with cerebral palsy in Ibadan, Nigeria. Our findings show that caregivers of children with cerebral palsy have lower generalized status compared with their peers caring for typically developing, that is, apparently early children living in the same community. This negative impact of caring on the health of the caregivers could in turn negatively affect compliance with physiotherapy schedule and home programs. In a more recent study, we reported that quality of life was also lower among people caring for children with cerebral palsy than their counterparts caring for typically developing children. We observed in this 2013 publication that as the mutual performance of the children with cerebral palsy improved, the quality of life of their caregivers also improved. However, their improved quality of life was more significant enough to set them at pass with their counterparts caring for typically developing children. Caring for stroke victims also impacts the quality of life of the caregivers. We observe that whether it is a spouse or other categories of family members that provide the care for the stroke survivor, their quality of life is impacted. However, the physical and social relationship domain, quality of life was more affected among the family members than other categories of caregivers. Matters relating to poor general health and low quality of life of the caregivers could affect compliance with physiotherapy appointment and execution of home programs. Non-compliance 
to return negatively affect the patient's overall chance of recovery. Another factor that influences compliance with physiotherapy schedule a more neuro physiotherapy seeking patient is affordability of physiotherapy care. In Nigeria, where many people have no insurance coverage, but rely on the payers to receive treatment plan, cost affordability is a big challenge. For example, in the 2011 study of pay of affordability of care by stroke victims receiving neuro physiotherapy at public hospitals in the Nigeria, our findings show that the patient while spending about 6.4% of their monthly income on post stroke physiotherapy care. Expending more than three quarters of their monthly income on physiotherapy services only cause of concern. The implication is that other aspects of the of patient's life will suffer in the process of receiving post stroke physiotherapy care. Of course, the possible extrapolation of this is that poverty will eventually prevent a patient needing physiotherapy after school not to receive adequate care. The second part, the environmental part. The World Report on Disability, jointly produced by the World Health Organization and the World Bank, revealed that more than 1 billion people, or 50% of the world population, live with disabilities of different types of animals. These scary people include those with hearing, seeing, learning, and mobility of human disabilities. Mobility disability may be more accentuated when the environment where the victim lives is discriminatory inconsiderate and non conducive Such a hostile environment will limit the ability to live meaningfully and independently in the community. This is an unfortunate experience among people with spinal cord injury, a common consequence of road traffic accidents in Nigeria and elsewhere. In 2013, the WHO report entitled Global Standard Report on Road Safety revealed that 1.24 million people are killed in road traffic accidents annually. 59% are between the ages of 15 and 44 years, and 77% are male. The report also showed that pedestrians and cyclists constitute 27% of all road deaths, with the figure had as 75% in some countries. The risk of dying as a result of road traffic injury is highest in the WHO African region and lowest in the WHO European region. Generally, between 20 and 15 million people are also reported to sustain non fatal injuries, including spinal cord and one. Of course, spinal cord, as we all know, is a sort of life transforming condition with consequential devastation, affecting overall functioning, making the patient become disabled and handicapped. The words disabled and handicapped will suggest that the victim is helpless and probably in danger. However, this is not a true reflection of the situation, as many of them are able to function within their limits. It is to encapsulate what happens when a patient that has functional limitation, especially resulting from physical challenges, that the WHO introduced the concept of ICL or the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health. The major significance of the ICL is that it acknowledges that every human being can suffer a decline in health and thereby experience some degrees of disability. Disability is described as the umbrella term for impairment activity limitation and participation restriction, and it refers to the negative aspect of interaction between an individual with a health condition and that individual's contextual factors, namely environmental and personal factors. Disability is not something that only happens to the minority of humanity. Kindly note that most people with advanced experiences one form of disability or the other. To paraphrase Dr. Michael Chan, the Director General of the WHO, I quote, almost every one of us will be permanently or temporarily disabled at some point in life. End of time. Think of old days and remember walking stick and witching. Better still, remember that person close to you who wears a pair of professional eyeglasses. It is to overcome his inability to see with his god given eyes on it. In other words, to overcome seeing disability. Thank God I'm not really here. Restraints, the experience of disability and recognizes it as a universal human experience. The ICF therefore classifies health and health related domains into body, individual, and societal perspectives by means of two lists. Number one, a list of body function and structure. Two, a list of domains of activity and participation. A list of environmental factors is also included in the ICF, considering that an individual functioning and disabilities occur in the context. Mr. Vice Chancellor, one question we should all be asking ourselves is this. To what extent does our environment ameliorate the body 
of mobility disability, ignorance, lack of empathy, absence of appropriate legislation, and lack of political will to enforce the available ones, sociocultural beliefs and environmental design are among the factors that make life even more difficult for people living with mobility disability in our society. Listen to this to appreciate the seriousness of the matter. The first of its kind study of accessibility of public buildings in Nevada, to which a user was carried out by Hamzat and Dada in 2005. We noted that fewer than 20% of public buildings, including those housing educational and recreational centers, were accessible to self propelling wheelchair users. This unfortunate situation could limit opportunities for community reintegration among people who use wheelchairs for ambulation. Furthermore, the challenges constantly faced by a present MBA student of this university due to lack of ramps to lecture room and some other centers comes to mind. It seems the annual of it may be lost on the medical sociologists and others in the faculty of the social sciences. At any rate, our medical library and the administrative building of the College of Medicine is not wheelchair accessible either. To bring it closer home, it appears that an individual who ambulates with the data of wheelchair may not be able to present his or inaugural lecture in this non wheelchair accessible trend <laughs> The only consolation, if you see it that way, to the foregoing indictment is that even the new physiotherapy building will be a job non wheelchair accessible. Though an individual using wheelchair for mobility can access the ground floor, there is no ramp leading from the ground floor to the first floor in the building. Such is the environment to which the neuro patient is expected to return and actively participate. I appeal to you that we should obey the clarion call by the same director general of the WHO and I quote, all of us must do more to break the barriers which segregate people with disabilities, in many cases forcing them to the margins of society. End of quote. The top part, the one part part. The major challenge we saw speciality of neurophysiotherapy faces is lack of adequate manpower. This is due in part to preference for less stressful specialties and limited opportunities for training people. In our survey of the opinions and beliefs of newly graduated physiotherapists in Nigeria about specialization and their specialty preferences, neurophysiotherapy ranked fourth of the seven preferred social specialties investigators. May I humbly remind you that I was the first to obtain a PhD in physiotherapy from many West African universities, and my specialty is neurophysiotherapy. Until August 2001, when I was employed as a lecturer in the University of Nigeria, there was no staff in my field in any university in Nigeria. I remained the sole expert in the Nigerian university system for about eight years, until when I didn't feel being there at OAU Lincoln, and Babati Bay Publisher at the at University of Nigeria, obtained PhD degrees in neurophysiotherapy and good success. Between 2001 and now, the total number of Nigerian-based physiotherapy with PhD degree in this field has increased by eight, with female accounting for two thirds. I am proud to say that I personally supervise half of this PhD degree research. They are those of Dr. Margaret Bukola Fatudimi, Dr. Luwa Bukola Adibis Yonalele, Dr. Fadir Rajibola Adepojo, and Dr. Grace Oluwa Titofu in descent from Obadi. I hasten to add here that I am not insinuating that it is only physiotherapists with PhD degrees that can effectively treat a neurological infection. There are presently about 60 physiotherapists with postgraduate studies, diploma, and master's degree in neurophysiotherapy practicing in Nigeria. This figure translates roughly to one neurophysiotherapist to 2.5 million Nigerians. This implies that there is only one neurophysiotherapist for 159 wards in the 774 local government area, constituted by 9,572 political wards, also regarded as the lowest unit of health services living in Nigeria. Mr. Vice Chancellor, physiotherapy intervention in neurological disease is usually stratified based on clinical evaluation and assessment. Let me illustrate the typical package of physiotherapy intervention in neurological disorders with my role in management of the vascular disease, otherwise called stroke. This is a disease condition which I have as an individual and collectively risk. Stroke is so named because of the way it strikes people down. It is also regarded now as brain attack based on its recognition as a medical emergency that demands urgent attention comparable to that of the heart attack. It is one of the most devastating neurological diseases, often causing death or gross physical impairment or disability. Risk factors for stroke include, although this does not necessarily mean the most possible, they include age, gender, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, abnormal blood lipid profile, 
high salt diet, transferred his chemical, diabetes mellitus, smoking, excessive alcohol intake, obesity, respiratory containing oral contraceptives, infection, and sickle cell disease. According to the World Stroke Organization, 15 million people suffer a stroke every year. Nearly 6 million people die because of it. And the projection is that by 2015, the number of deaths will be up to 6.5 million people. The group prevalence rate of 114 per 100,000 Nigerians was reported in a community-based study in Lagos, in Nigeria, by Janessi et al. They concluded that stroke prevalence rates in urban Nigeria were lower than those in most developed countries. The simple test to know if a stroke has occurred is regarded as fast test. F for face. Ask the person to smile. Does one side droop? Ask. Ask the individual to raise the two hands. Does one side drift down? Speech. Can the person repeat a simple sentence? Does he or she have trouble pronouncing few words or letters? Time. Time is critical, just like it's critical for this presentation. The time stroke is synonymously used with cerebrovascular disease and cerebrovascular activity. Why some specialists tend to prefer the CVD? As a neurophysiotherapist, I like to use CVA. This is not to create any identity. Rather, it is because cerebrovascular accident captures indication for physiotherapy referral data. Remember, it is only the aftermath of the accident, namely hemorrhagic or ischemic event that I manage. It bears repeating that whenever a stroke is suspected, prompt medical attention should be sought. However, in Nigeria, many factors could cause delay reporting at the hospital and commencing treatment, including referral to physiotherapy. These are poverty, poor knowledge of the disease, lack of access to hospital and rehabilitation facilities, as well as environmental or physical factors, such as transportation and insecurity. Finding a solution to the challenges of poor access to post office and service services in Nigeria is of interest to me and others. Ideas that come to mind include bringing physiotherapy to the respective homes of those who can afford domiciliary physiotherapy and offering the service at the primary health care center with a view to integrating post office physiotherapy into the primary health care policy in Nigeria. This conjecture, however, needs scientific substantiation before they can be advocated. To explore this, we compare the outcomes of physiotherapy intervention on selected indices of the problem for stroke survivors treated at primary health care centers with those treated in their respective places of domicile. Our findings reveal that both groups recorded significant improvement in their clinical status. We therefore concluded that rehabilitating at any of these locations, which are outside the traditional hospital setting, may enhance access to post stroke physiotherapy in a low-income country like Nigeria. Some of our findings are stroke. The most significant physical manifestation of stroke requiring physiotherapy is the mutual paralysis and hemiplegia is a common physical presentation. By hemiplegia, we mean paralysis of one mirror half of the body with or without affectation of the lower total muscles of facial expression. Loss of balance, which can present as standing asymmetry, is a clinical feature that impacts negatively on post-stroke working gait, and performance of activities of daily living. We observe that among post-stroke individuals, the lesser the standing asymmetry, the better their motor performance and gait pattern. In a more recent study with a colleague in Ghana, I observed that post-stroke individuals who work with a stick at poorer balance and less to share center participation than their eight mat counterparts who work on needed. This is contrary to the commonly heard view that using a walking stick will enhance balance and promote function. Another research, also with colleagues in Ghana, showed that standing asymmetry is negatively influenced by advancement and positively by the duration of physiotherapy received after stroke. This signifies the importance of physiotherapy in restoration of balance after it. Balance retraining may, however, involve use of expensive equipment and modalities that are not readily available in this environment. There is therefore a need to find alternative, yet effective tools that will serve the purpose in the low income country. I'm sad and personally provided instructive evidence based information on what such equipment is stepping as an effective tool to train balance. Working, which is critical to functional activities of daily living, facilitates discharging from hospital and non location. My experience in clinical practice is that post work individuals often demand for an idea of the time they will be able to resume independent work. This is always a tricky question because the quality of working activities depend on many clinical and non clinical factors. 
I collaborated with a colleague to investigate how selected clinical and psychosocial factors may determine post to dependent working ability. We discovered that age, an initial level of disability rather than personality traits, has significant influence on independent working. We also observed the female gender advantage on commencement of independent working, although this was not statistically significant. In another study, we noted that post working individuals worked only at a speed of between 0.25 meters per second and 0.42 meters per second, which is about 22 to 36% of the speed that apparently every sex and age mark peers work at. Normally, all of us tend to work at an average of 1.14 meters per second. Besides lower speed, significantly higher energy is also expended during working, and this can contribute to functional disability, especially among the deconditioned older patients. The energy cost of ambulation can, however, be reduced through an exercise training program. Through research, I found that a 10 week full weight bearing ambulatory exercise training on the treadmill resulted in significant 28% reduction in energy cost of working. The gait pattern of stroke survivors also improved during this period of training. Another factor that could limit upper limb function and gait pattern after a stroke is pain. A 2010 investigation of the incidence of musculoskeletal pain. And it's in part of motor performance among community dwelling stroke survivors showed that 79.4% had pain symptoms, out of which 23.5% had the pain predating stroke onset. We also observed that musculoskeletal pain was as common as central postural pain, and the presence of musculoskeletal pain was associated with lower motor performance. This is an indication that pain assessment and treatment should be given adequate attention in stroke care. Post-work impairment also exerts a significant impact on other aspects of the patient's living, namely activity, participation, community reintegration, and quality of life. In the first of this kind of study in Nigeria, I collaborated with Dr. Grace Vincent on Obadi to explore a six-month interrelationship between motor function, activity, participation, and quality of life among stroke survivors in Ibadan. Our findings from this pioneer longitudinal study revealed that motor function Activity and participation of stroke survivors improved progressively over a six-month period. We also observed that significant recovery of motor function did not translate to improved overall quality of life, although it correlated significantly with health remain quality of life. The implication of this is that factors other than physical function may be determinants of quality of life in this group. In a separate 12-month longitudinal study, we also found that functional activity improved linearly and significantly up to 10 months after stroke onset and then infection. Physiotherapy and stroke care. A patient who has suffered a stroke may present in physiotherapy clinic with hemiplegia, cognitive dysfunction, abnormal gait pattern, abnormal muscle tone, loss of balance and movement, loss of function, physical dependence, disability, low community participation, and reduced quality of life. For stroke, the neurophysiotherapist therefore manages the patient with an intricate or physical psychological, social, and spiritual problems. As a neurophysiotherapist, my intervention for stroke can be discussed under one acute, two motor restoration, and three, the reintegration phase. The acute phase. This is the period immediately following a stroke. The patient is typically on the regular hospital ward or a stroke unit and physiotherapy commences as soon as possible, usually within 24 hours of recovery. It is the most critical stage which can set the tone for the level of motor recovery that the patient may achieve over time. Here, the neurophysiotherapist will ensure the following. One, prevent contractures and abnormal synergies using pillows to appropriately pursue the limbs in the body. Two, ensure pregnancy of the respiratory airway and adequate ventilation through respiratory physiotherapy. This is to prevent accumulation of mucus in the chest and lung collapse, especially if the patient is unconscious. Three, promote adequate circulation to prevent venous stasis and DVT using mobilization exercise and functional activity in the Four, prevent development of or manic pressure so using regular turning activities, usually with velocity, and use of physical modalities like acting in therapy. Five, minimize any abuse through the process of conducting all activities, including nursing care and interaction with the patient from the paralytic side. And six, pain management, using radiant and conducting heat massage and other physical modalities and procedures as may be indicated. As it is practiced in a comprehensive specialist workplace in Trod and Norway, early systematic mobilization, including out of bed activity, can also commence within 17 hours of stroke onset. This has been the principle of stroke management at that center for about 20 years, 
and impressive results have been reported. The society approach to stroke rehabilitation at the University College of Sweden and in many parts of Nigeria is to commence the role of therapy as early as possible. This is in order to facilitate good and quick recovery and promote early home distance. I'm glad to say that we are also certainly getting fantastic results. Making physiotherapy care intensive at this phase is also recommended as it will reduce mortality and enhance better and quicker recovery. This will reduce the time spent on the hospital work, lessen the economic cost and overall burden on the family caregivers, minimize pressure on the limited manpower and facilities in the hospitals, and most importantly, reduce stroke associated disability. The second phase, mutual restoration phase. At this second phase, the patient is still on the hospital work and the pattern of mutual dysfunction is established. The patient is then commenced on physiotherapy assisted or guided mutual training activities. The focus of neurophysiotherapy at this phase includes the following one, management of spasticity, two, retraining functional activities, three, static and dynamic balance restoration, four, working re education, five, cancer therapy, six, pain management, and seven, prevention of lymph complications. The principles, procedures, and protocols are used include the one based on the respective and our combination of global technique, mutual reliable technique of Karen Shepard, to present the muscular facilitation made popular by Carbat and Hood. It is at this stage that the patient is considered for this surgery. It is pertinent to say that the common practice around here is to discharge the patient as soon as it is considered to be medically stable, often with minimal functional recovery recovery. It will appear that functional ability is not a strong factor in determining when the patient is discharged from the inpatient facility in Nigeria. This practice needs revising, especially considering that there is no stop over between the hospital ward and the respective room of patients in Nigeria. The third phase, reintegration phase. By this phase, the patient will become community dwelling. Because recovery from stroke can continue over several years, it still receives and benefits from neurophysiotherapy, even though recovery tends to depend on nature, severity of initial deficit, and no stroke factors. While the acute phase is the most critical, the reintegration phase is the most delicate and complicated in side practice. So far, I need to say that it is the phase when, they are, when, as the American will say, the jury is in. My clinical experience is that while many stroke victims will indicate during the mutual restoration phase that they have come to terms with this life changing incident, the story changes when they leave the hospital. For many of them, the problem becomes real and so fully appreciated only after they've been discharged from the inpatient facilities and return to the world where they live. Physiotherapy plan at this place is to intensify our functional retraining, how to do ambulation retraining and restoration of heart function. It also focuses on both instrument and non-instrument activities of daily living function within the household, as well as community activities, all within the scope of ease or capability. The neurophysiotherapist also manages stroke-related disability and thereby reducing his impact on the overall well-being of the community where he is protected. While motor ability remains central to achieving these aims, the neurophysiotherapist also pays attention to improving on the non-motor constraints, like the cardiorespiratory endurance, which will influence the efficiency of the patient motor system. For instance, reduced level of physical activity, which is commonly observed after a stroke, will lead to reduced aerobic capacity and physical deconditioning, which is a significant determinant of poor health and stroke survival. I have observed earlier that community dwelling stroke survivors and lower cardiac respiratory function and their age might come up. The outcome of my doctoral research work using greater treadmill working exercise showed that aerobic capacity of individuals with chronic stroke can be improved upon through a carefully prescribed, gradually progressed, and closely monitored exercise conditioning program. Part of physiotherapy intervention and reintegration fits to therefore include the endurance of physical fitness training so that the stroke victims will be able to endure the stress and strain of day-to-day -day living. The ultimate goal is to enhance community reintegration of the patient and achieve improvement in the overall health-related quality of life. Mr. Vice President, from the fourth goal, it is obvious that commenting with the acute phase when the patient is on the hospital ward, through the phase of mutual restoration and the reintegration back to the community in his ward of local cancer, the neurophysiotherapist is at hand and hard at work, returning several times over many months to ensure that the favorable result is produced. I wish to submit that the central role I play as a neurophysiotherapist 
in facilitating the return of the small victims from the hospital work to reintegrate them back to the world where their domicile is not debated. Apart from being alive, the single most important concern for most of victims is being able to independently and functionally use the paralyzed limbs, that is, to overcome problems of mutual impairment. Through what means can this be achieved? Neurophysiotherapy offers for playing such a critical role in helping the patient achieve his ultimate goal of returning home in his world from the journey of helplessness while in the acute phase of the hospital world, it is simply out to describe the neurophysiotherapist as a returning officer who bears good results. <laughs> Appropriate caption for the foregoing discourse, therefore, is from word to word, the neurophysiotherapist as a returning officer. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, I painted a rather simplified picture of how a patient with a specific neurological disorder stroke is taken through a route from the hospital work to the world of his local cancer, with me, the neurophysiotherapist, at the center of activities. As a returning officer, and with all the facts considered, I hereby declare that for the neurologically inpatient, neurophysiotherapy works. I wish to put on record that the degree of success recorded in the installation of independent function by the neurological patient is always through sweat and strain on the part of the neurophysiotherapist as well. My intervention is such that I'm not only applying my knowledge and skills, I expend a lot of physical energy lifting regions, segments, and even the entire body of the patient, and physically demonstrating the required movements and functional skills in the patient that I'm rehabilitating. I do this for virtually every patient with central nervous system vision. As recovery of motor function is often long term, the patient, that is the neuro patient, typically spend months and sometimes years receiving neurophysiotherapy. My mode of treatment is therefore not a one time or few, few weeks under close monitoring treatment of care. Neurological physiotherapy is a marathon kind of care rather than a sprint or a medium distance care. This declaration is further corroborated by the fact that the victims tend to live with the aftermath that includes residual paralysis, pain, distorted gait function, or immobility, as well as feeling of actual stigmatization and other prejudices in the community. The work is therefore ongoing for the neurophysiotherapist, even after the patient has been returned to the community. Remember that I am the first to admit that I work as a member of the health team, and particularly neuro rehabilitation team. I can claim, however, without any fear of contradiction, that I'm the only healthcare practitioner whose line of intervention perfectly fits into the world back common saying that as a cocoa, when you cocoa and you jump back. The cocoa farmer is exposed to as much heat from the sun as the cocoa sun that is soon drying. There is a need to understand the scope and peculiarities of my professional practice, and most especially my so specialty of neuro physiotherapy. This is unfortunate. That those who are supposed to know do not even bother to find out at all. The notion that the same capital certainly does not apply to physiotherapy. Matters arise. Mr. Vice Chancellor, the seven points communicate from this lecture are one, neurophysiotherapy is essential for anyone who has neurological deficit. This expertise helps to restore motor function, which is considered the most significant and the most obvious physical challenge that accompanies neurological disorders and upon which ability to function independently and meaningfully in the community is based. Point number two. The role of the neurophysiotherapist is undoubtedly not limited to the four walls of the hospital or clinic. It extends beyond the traditional hospital setting to after discharge when the patient needs training in functional activities necessary to navigate within the community. Three, physiotherapy is physical therapy. It is a form of therapy that involves not just the use of skills, knowledge, and physical modalities, but also physical exertion by both the patient and the physiotherapist. It is not a one-time consultative health practice. It is usually a long term, lasting at least several weeks. Four, healthcare policy makers and hospital administrators in Nigeria should endeavor to understand the meaning, scope, and peculiarities of physiotherapy. It is only when this is done that physiotherapy will be accorded the proper recognition and utilized to its fullest potential in delivering quality health care to Nigerians. 
the kind of appreciation we specialists in neurosciences are, that it takes a team effort to make a patient get better, should be imbibed by the entire healthcare staff. Five, Nigerian government at every level as well as institutions should promulgate law, ethics, and regulation and enforce compliance with the laws enacted as per accessibility of public buildings and utilities to people with disability, especially those with mobility disability. We should all remember that injustice to one is injustice to one. We should all think of our holding when arthritis or even neurological disorders may prevent independent working when working still becomes the third leg and wheelchair becomes a customized chair car. Six, effort should be intensified by our concern to increase the number of neurophysiotherapy experts in the country. And seven, neurophysiotherapy should be considered for inclusion in the primary health care policy in Nigeria. Support systems should also be put in place for caregivers of Nigerians with neurological disorders. Gratitude. In the course of my educational and professional journey, Many people have served as my guides and guardians, and to them, I'm very grateful. In starting an moment, we want a learning professor, not a learned professor. One who cannot read is not better than one who does not. End of it. Because I'm a learning professor, I'm bound to make the mistake of omitting some vital names from this list. Please pardon my failures in omitting your body of listed names. It is not missing with God. Who will reward you all upon them? I want to begin by appreciating you all, a wonderful audience. And starting with the first African physiotherapist, the 87 year young Pa Dr. T. Abayo Mosh. <laughs> he has led our physiotherapist, including our neighbor elders, Mrs. Olako Jumuga and others to this occasion. May I humbly request Papa Dr. Abayo Mosh to kindly stand up for recognition. Papa. Papa has led leading physiotherapists like I said, like our mama, Olakwe Jonga, Registrar MRTB, President NSP, and Registrar PPC. I recognize specially the OC, Obubada of Obubada Land, Dr. Lekon Obubada. I acknowledge the foundation line report of all my teachers at the pre university level, starting with my teachers at the Madrasa of Anfa Balaga at Okearimu in Ibadan, St. Paul Anglican Primary School, Yemeti, Okebadan High School, and Ohio State College of Ibadan Science. All my teachers in this university, most especially those who mentor and inspired me in the field of physiotherapy, named the late Pajay Ogiri, Professor Ariola Olasumbo, Nipere Sanda. My wonderful teacher, supervisor, mentor, former of my department, and city deputy vice chancellor at the University of Ibadan. <laughs> Professor Shumila Dele Amosuna of the University of Cape Town, South Africa, Dr. Adiru Nikkei Omobo Nikkei Akinfebe, my teacher and current director of the University of Cape Dr. Kamal Dina Sonny Nani, U.S., Dr. Nufumilayo Alawali, Nani, the U.K. Reverend Adi Oluwa, O. Jairusin. I salute all other lecturers in my department, including Dr. A. F. Adini and Dr. Udu Kola Onalehe, who are among the first set of MSc students that I supervise in this university. I'm glad to say that while Dr. A. F. Adini has been coordinating all activities related to this lecture, Dr. Udu Abu Kola Onalehe, alongside Dr. Bola Orima Dino of ICH, and Dr. Udu Kola Patudino, as well as my wife, have been my sparring partners for the lecture itself. As a clinical student, and later, Wiki physiotherapist. I learned at the feet of notable physiotherapists, including the kind, godly, and supportive Mr. Razak Kaji Bodo Alangi Waju, the hardworking Mr. K. Moroti, Sir B. Adegi, Mr. T. J. Oyeun, Mr. Lekha Olatuji, and the gentleman physiotherapist by excellence, Mr. Olatuji Mbojunawo. I recognize other wonderful physiotherapist seniors, contemporaries, and colleagues from UCH, or your state and other parts of Nigeria, especially members of my 1994 class of physiotherapy. To my other lecturers in this university, especially my lecturers and instructors at the Department of Human Kinetics and Health Education, represented by Professor Veronica Ibanugo and Professor J.F. I'm sure you know the obvious. 
I want to appreciate most especially my wonderful teacher and doctoral degree course supervisor, and obeying a highly cerebral gentleman neurologist, Professor Adishola Obini, about whom I've always wondered how it is possible to be so brilliant and yet modest. I wish to specifically acknowledge those who have served as my career counselors, advisors, and guiders over the years, including Professor Julius Ikatua and his very kind wife, Dr. Matilda Ikatua. I appreciate my thoughtful father and friend and leader, Professor Ayi Kadi Wale, the current DC of this university. Professor Ladi Kaur, the new former DC, Professor Shegun Chino Aki Inka, current provost, Professor Ibed Wola Inka, current DC admin, I mean, I'm an academic professor, Emmanuel Mazinaga, Professor Levin, B.O. Adebo, a godly and very supportive gentleman, Professor Moni Olai Tonsunyo Mbu, whom I served under as a student shortly after my employment in this university. I also thank Professor and Dr. Ms. Samuel Olofo, Professor O.G.B. Wog, Professor F.A. Pentola, Dr. Gani Adenino, as well as Dr. Mrs. Victoria Semoto, Mr. Ladi Subaira, and Mr. Shola Adesoko. I appreciate the presence of all at online here present, I appreciate the Alpha Mufti of Ibadan Land, Imam Abu Fatah Jiwalaga, who is the spiritual head of my extended family, the Hotel Oluba of Ibadan Land, and the Ocean of I would like to publicly appreciate Mrs. M. Moderni, the outstanding retail assistant director of pharmacy at the UCH, for a prophecy of the year 2000 that came to pass. When I went to Itamala on the announcement of Professor Sonia as a professor in 2000, she looked at me. I was a bloody PhD student, still struggling with data collection. She said, Kolako, continue to work and you are the next physiotherapy professor in the University of Kabbalah. <laughs> also, unprecedented is a positive contribution of my truly loyal friends, Debo Ajani, Jibola Azad, Shebelo, Debola, Romani, Gunshola, Dibutan, etc. I thank the past and current non teaching staff of the Department of Physiotherapy, staff of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences and College of Medicine. To all my former and present students, especially the more than 50 of them that I've supervised, who are scattered all over the world, and all those with whom I've had the opportunity to collaborate with research and their work, I say a very big thank you. Surely it has been fruitful working with you. I especially appreciate my siblings, their spouses, and their children for their prayers, physical and financial support and sages. My dearest, big sister, and many mother, God willing, the Abode, the Asopila Big brother for Thai, big sister who about big brother of the Kabin, and my younger ones have been not two years and side and not you. My other mother, two Mrs. Letitia Lani Yano, and other siblings are really appreciated for their love and kindness, most especially my beloved sister and friend, the big jokers, the Ramirez, and her daughters, Denny and Natasha I Also, thank God for good people like my Baba Alaji Wah, my Wala Sudina, Waiki and Natisha Lani. I acknowledge all the good people I've had to work with in this university. As well as the people across crossed that road and have enriched my life, they are well appreciated. Thanks to my extended family here present, led by my pastor and Shay, to the Emir of Salam Malaga. I appreciate all my stepbrothers and stepsisters here present. I also appreciate my maternal family, the Akandes, led by their patrons, to the King Bissi Akandi and his friend, to the Malaga and the Malaga. To all Imams and Alphas here present, I say Jazakunaira and Shoko. Adoration. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Some things in life do not have universal measure. One of such is God's blessing. However, I submit that a good, a good one is a good standard, especially when you have the university that will be in the room and in the It is a good wife that bears for good children. I thank God for blessing me with a true friend, a lifetime co traveler, dedicated companion, confident, supportive. <laughs> My very beautiful and extremely intelligent friend, DC Hilda Amike Hamza. She is my manager who never assumed the role of a director. Thanks, my love, for choosing to manage me as I am and for managing me very effectively. I love you and I use this opportunity to again affirm that I'm grateful for your never ending support and care. I also appreciate you for giving us wonderful children, my adorable, inspiration, and wonderful. Charismatic Aisha, you are joking, hear me as well. My caring soulmate and great fan, Omar, I got told you, Papa Mia, and my charming and caring, Naida, I got told you, Omar, I'm immensely grateful for the stability and peace of mind that I get from you, my wife, and our children. I really cannot thank God enough for blessing me with a wonderful wife and fantastic children as companions. 
there was a time. There was a time when God posted to this world some of his precious creatures whom he decided to recall one by one at moments when all the people who start across their path first began. The good desire is that the light be left still shines. To three of them I dedicate my inaugural lecture. They are number one, Haji Amzat Akonjiya Salam Alaga, a true friend of God, Wali, a scholar of uncommon pedigree, grandson of a who calls him the Alimi Unimi Mok in the Yoga, my protective and supportive father and fantastic family. Aji Aola Jokey Amzat, my strongest father. Loyal friend, caring and protective, peace loving mother. A rallying point in the family who never doubted my ability to make a success of anything I laid my hands upon. I pray in me, so only save me and my life. I pray God to continue blessing my prayers with my journal. The third one, architect, only where he wants Stephen's value. A bundle of brilliance, a real gentleman to the top. An index of what hard work, honesty, and kindness look like. He it was who gave this my wife out to me in marriage. The gentleness will continue to rise in confidence. This day in history, exactly 11 years ago today, on the sixth day of February 2003, my mother, Ajia Jeke Amzat, was permitted to murder her. The honor of today all goes to our sweet memory. I am truly very grateful to all of you for your presence and this lecture. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, distinguished audience, that has been the inaugural lecture of the learning professor who after a few days at the primary school said enough is enough. I'm not going to school again. So Jojuma le yo man losi school. Si man losi school no Jojuma ta no man kule to mama baba ji amen. Is it every day one will be going to school? If I should be going to school every day, who would then remain at home to be sharing plenty of my mama, which I'd like to share with my father then. I pray God to return you all in peace from this up, to the comfort of your respective home in your works, and look at government areas, and to thank all of you Without exception for your kindness, you may all return to your home. I thank you all and God bless